Um, when I saw today's topic, I thought, well, this is going to be the shortest program ever. The speaker will come up and say no and take a few questions and we'll go home. But uh, I thought about this for a minute and, and, and here's, let's think about this. What, what does it mean when we say that someone is mentally ill? And who, who gets to decide that, well, this guy over here, he's kind of eccentric, but this guy over here, we don't need to let him get a gun in his hand. Who, who makes these decisions? And are we talking about taking away all gun privileges from, for all types of mental illness or, or just some? I, I don't, uh, th these are hard questions. And if I, if I do become mentally ill, do I automatically lose my right to self-defense? If I'm cured, do I get my, to get my gun back? I, I don't know the answer to these things. Th these, these are hard questions. Um, and some people think that just having a gun, that, that's kind of proves you're mentally ill in itself. And other people think, well, that's the sanest thing you can do in a violent society is have protect. So what are, what are we supposed to think? I, I, here I am. Who came up with this topic? This gentleman over here to my left. Uh, are you packing uh, something? I tell you, the more, the more I thought about this topic, the, the, the more nervous I got. So, uh, But this is what happens when you know, that philosophy professors wander off the campus. We, we, we're going along, we think we're happy in life, have everything figured out, and boom, he throws this, this curveball at us. So uh, but we do appreciate Dr. Wood and, and uh, Dr. Messel for take, setting aside their books and taking time away from teaching classes to come and share their thoughts with us, and, and I'll let Dr. Woods tell us what the rest of the program's going to be like. I don't, d does the gun have a, a gun, uh, the, the library have a gun policy? Or do people have to leave their guns at the door? Uh, anyone here armed currently? No? Well, this is all very good. Thank you, Ron, for that, uh, those remarks. And thank you all for coming out. Um, our speaker today uh, is Jonathan Metzel. Um, and I apologize to him for the spelling. There's no E, uh, there's no second E in his surname. Um, and he is, um, he's got many uh, titles at Vanderbilt. He's the, uh, the Frederick B. Rentschler II Professor of Sociology. He's a professor of psychiatry. And I think probably m most importantly, he's the director of um, Medicine, Health, and Society program, which is a um, very uh, enterprising and active program at Vanderbilt. He's um, uh, got a PhD from the University of Michigan, 2001. He uh, is a kind of real hybrid character. Um, he's uh, a kind of mixture of a humanities guy and a medicine guy. He's got degrees in English literature and American studies on the one hand and biology and medicine on the other. He's written uh, at least a couple of uh, great books, one Prozac on the Couch and another called The Protest Psychosis. So he's, uh, and, and he's now, what is it, a kind of commentator for MSNBC and NBC, he's out there on in the radio uh, trying to change the world um, in a public way as well as being uh, a very active researcher and uh, organizer at Vanderbilt. Now often uh, when we go to the doctor we feel relieved uh, if we can walk away with a prescription. But we also know that many of our ailments are not just medical problems but personal or even social problems. And despite all these advances in gene therapy that Vanderbilt is also engaged in, we know the body's not just a, an organism. We're connected in positive and negative ways to the people and the cultures around us. And this is sometimes kind of obvious with illnesses like depression and anxiety. It's also true with you know, obesity and even cancer. Uh, that they're not just biological conditions. Health 
and society are nowhere more connected than in questions about gun violence. And I have to say, that these issues are really weird for somebody coming like me from England, where you, know, you don't see a gun. In fact, even the police have these truncheons. They have like riot sticks, but they don't have guns. And guns are just not around. So you start thinking about when you come, when you're in England, you think not should the mentally ill bear arms, but should people bear arms? I mean, why would they want to have guns uh, at all? Uh, so it, it may be to some extent uh, an American uh, problem. And it is a real one if you think about the terrible tragedies that we've seen uh, in the last few years. There have been many remedies suggested uh, to curb these tragic events, including um, keeping guns out of the hands of people who are disturbed. Uh, but when we start listening to some of the commentators, especially the, the extreme uh, gun rights people, you wonder if those people don't have issues too, uh, <laughs> whether they should be allowed to. Yeah. And the I think the, pro the broader question of guns in society really calls out for people who can think across the boundaries between law and medicine and uh, social policy. And today, our guy to talk about that is Jonathan Metzl, and he's going to talk about whether the mentally ill should bear arms. Jonathan. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here today. It's really an honor for me for a, a number of reasons. One is because I just live right here in, in Printer's Alley, so it was about the shortest commute I've ever had to, to go give a talk. It took me about uh, 14 seconds to come over here. Uh, but it's really nice to see these kind of conversations. Uh, uh, the, uh, the first uh, person who spoke said uh, this is going to be the shortest talk ever. Uh, so. Um, I can just say no and maybe sit down and have some more lunch. Um, but let me just say that I, I'm somebody that, as David just mentioned, I, I'm a psychiatrist, but I also study American so, uh, society. And my work looks at psychiatric stigma, basically, stigma against mental illness. And so the quote, uh, the, the kind of title for this talk actually was taken from a pretty serious column in the New York Times that happened in the aftermath of Newtown that was really asking this question of should the mentally ill bear arms? And in a way, the, the critique that I had, that, as you'll see over the next 25 or 30 minutes here, was pretty similar to what w we've just heard, which is this question of what does it mean to be mentally ill? And it, as, as it turns out, um, um, you know, the assumptions about what mental illness means in this debate are incredibly charged, they're incredibly problematic, and they're incredibly stigmatizing in a way. And so the question of whether or not a particular group of people should or shouldn't uh, exercise their Second Amendment rights uh, turns out to be a, a conversation that's also about assumptions about gender and about race and about racism and about a bunch of other questions. And so it's, it's very complicated in a way. And so um, you know, what I hope to do is explain to you why I think that this debate in a very short period of time is complicated. Now, um, let me just be uh, pretty straightforward and say that um, I don't want to in any way be insensitive to the fact that as a nation, no matter what side of the political divide you're on or what side of the gun debate you're on, I think we can all agree that we've just had a tremendous, tremendous national tragedy and in a way a national awakening that was a, in a way a wake-up call beyond even the kinds of mass shootings that we've seen before. Now this is very recent history, but as everybody knows, on December 14th of last year, uh, a 20-year-old uh, uh, former student at a particular school, Adam Lanza, uh, killed his mother with a semi-automatic rifle and then went uh, to Sandy Hook Elementary School and had, I've been reviewing actually the police uh, reports and it was actually an incredibly short uh, duration shooting spree over the course of about eight or nine minutes. Uh, he uh, went on a shooting spree throughout the school shot entire classrooms of first grade students, um, killed at, at the end of his spree 20 children and six adults before turning the gun on himself. And this again was, no matter what side of the political debate you're on, a national awakening about what is the role of guns in our society and, and what really should we do to do this. And what's interesting for me, I was doing a lot of M uh, MSNBC media and NBC media in the days after, after the event, 
And what we saw was that uh, directly afterwards, there was a real national reckoning for this question of where do we go from here? And in a way, uh, we saw, I think at least in those couple of days or even the week after the Newtown shooting, that it broke down uh, usual political divides between Republican and Democrat or right and left, that people were really thinking this is a wake up call when our children are dying in a place like a school that should be a safe place. And so I think that question led to a lot of soul searching. And certainly President Obama uh, gave a, a press conference that said pretty much the same thing two days after the shooting where he said, this is, this is different. I mean, his, the message of his press conference at the time was this is different than the stuff that we've been used to. So even though we've had mass shootings before, when kids start getting killed in schools, in the safety of schools, that in a way, this is a kind of different conversation than the ones that we've had before. And I think that there really was an opening at that moment to have a, a pretty serious conversation that didn't polarize in the way that other gun debates have polarized after mass shootings. Now, as everybody knows, that didn't exactly happen. Uh, and very quickly, after about uh, three or four days or even a week, there were a series of kind of debates where basically the, the rhetoric, I mean, there were many things and many things have been happening, but it did seem like deja vu all over again after that, and that all of a sudden, about a week or two weeks later, there was this very familiar debate about on one hand, people said gun rights are a Second Amendment issue and we're not gonna give up our guns, and in fact, we need more guns to protect our schools. Uh, and on the other hand, people were saying, if nothing else, how is this not a wake-up call that we need fewer guns? And so, in a way, that felt, it, you know, it, it, like this moment potentially had been lost and that there was a tremendous amount of discord on both sides really about this question of do we need more guns or do we need fewer guns? And certainly, uh, again, I, I don't want to be too judgmental about that debate and that I think that there were very well-intentioned people on all sides of the gun debate that were trying to argue, you know, in a way, the question was, how do we keep kids safe in a way? And so I think that on one hand, there was a lot of, you know, good intention, but there also was a lot of discord in a way. And there was a lot of anxiety, there was a lot of fear. I'll never forget, after I did my N NBC thing, I, I came here and I got <laughs> hit in the mouth in a basketball game and I had to go to the dentist, and my dentist had a gun. Uh, and I said, uh, why, why do you have a gun? Like, what's going on? I, you know, I don't think you need that really, hopefully not for my dental procedure today. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, Obama's gonna take our guns. And so I'm keeping my gun near me because Obama's gonna take our, our, our guns. And I said, well, did you have a gun before? And he said, well, no, we d my wife and I just went out and bought guns, you know, two weeks ago because, and so it's, it, I kept thinking like, how's Obama gonna take your gun if you didn't even have a gun in the first place? Um, so it was kind of, but, but I think it spoke to this tremendous anxiety about, the, you know, this debate about like kind of people losing their rights, which seemed to me to be a, in a way at the core of a lot of these disagreements that really were very, very personal. I don't think that my dentist was, I mean, hopefully he didn't confuse like the Novocaine pen and the gun when he was filling, you know, my cavity or something like that. But I would say that, um, in a way, it just spoke to the tremendous passion, the tr tremendous passion and angst, and really the tremendous discord that evolved around this question about, you know, the kind of central question: Do we take people's guns away, or, or do we? Um, uh, or is that the way we frame it, or is it a question of safety? Um, but I will say that, a as somebody who's a psychiatrist. Even among all the discord, there did seem to be a central, dis, uh, a central point of agreement that, com that kind of joined the left and the right of this debate. And that point of agreement was that somehow this shooting told us something about the, uh, the, what happens when people with mental illness uh, get guns, basically. And so it seemed like across the political spectrum, people agreed that what this shooting told us was that this was an issue of mental illness. And certainly that was the case in the mainstream media, where right away after the talk, after the shooting, you saw media commentators rushing to diagnose Adam Lanza, first of all, with schizophrenia. And so there were a lot of, uh, um, a lot of articles like these ones that basically said that this is a problem when people with schizophrenia have guns. Now, as you just heard, my research is on schizophrenia and stigma against schizophrenia. So of course I was paying very close attention to this. And so initially the media went to diagnose Adam Lanza with schizophrenia and they said, oh, this is a problem because people with schizophrenia are unduly violent or hostile. 
And then a couple of days later, people said, no, actually, maybe it wasn't schizophrenia. Then the diagnosis all of a sudden became Asperger's disorder. And then people were saying, how can we get guns away from Asperger's disorder when really there's no, there was no literature about violence and Asperger's disorder at all. And so they were, in a way, kind of creating these diagnoses on the fly as a way of, uh, as a way of kind of producing evidence for this assumption that mental illness was somehow to blame for these shootings. Now, as that happened, we also saw arguments that actually are playing out in the political arena to this day, which said that even if we don't do background checks, at least what we should do is have mental illness screening so that we can know the mental illness histories of people who, who are purchasing guns. And again, that's still part of our political discourse for people who have seen the, 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 the paper this morning. Um, it wasn't just the media that was uh, perpetuating what, uh, this stigmatization or this stereotype. Uh, did anybody here by any chance see the, uh, the uh, Wayne LaPierre press conference the week after the Sandy Hook shooting? If anybody watched it, it was incredible political theater. But basically what uh, LaPierre said when he got up was, there is a problem in this country, but it's not a problem of guns, it's a problem of mental illness. And so what he was arguing for, among other things, was a national registry of people with mental illness so they could basically track people with mental illness. And he was make, making this argument that um, it, th these shootings are perpetuated by deranged killers who are psychotic and all these kind of things. And therefore, his argument was that we needed to have a national database of what he called, quote unquote, the mentally ill. Now, this was also uh, an argument that played out across the right. So for people who are fans of Ann Coulter, you know that she had a, she's never won at loss for a soundbite or a tweetable quote. Uh, and her quote that got played again and again was, guns don't kill people, the mentally ill do. Now, um, in a way, uh, let me be clear, we've heard this kind of narrative before. People are probably thinking that right now, and that this association between guns and mental illness in the aftermath of mass shootings is something we've heard a lot. So we heard this story in the aftermath of the shooting in Aurora, Colorado, where there was a, dr a, de a big debate about whether the shooter Holmes had uh, schizophrenia. We certainly know that that was the case in the aftermath of the, of the Tucson shooting with uh, Gabrielle Giffords, where everybody was kind of debating, did Jared Loeffner, the shooter, ha ha have schizophrenia? So again, we've heard, th we've heard this before, but I think what was different about the aftermath of the Sandy Hook shooting was that this time we actually applied legislation to this question of the association between mental illness and, and, and gun violence. And I say that because I was just on a panel in New York a couple of weeks ago about a legislative uh, a intervention that they're doing in New York in which they passed a new piece of legislation that's now being copied in other states. And basically, as you can see here, the legislation requires psychiatrists to basically report patients who they feel are a threat, a violent threat, to local authorities. And so in a way, what, the, what we're asking psychiatrists to do is if they feel that a patient might be dangerous for some kind of criteria, these patients are then being uh, reported to local officials who then go to the patient's house and confiscate their firearms. And this is legislation that started in New York and it's already been passed and it's gonna start to be enacted here pretty soon. But um, there are also similar pieces of legislation that are going through Ohio, Maryland, Colorado, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Utah. And so this question of putting people with uh, psychiatric authority in the position of, in a way, diagnosing gun violence before, before it happens. Now, let me say again that I, I think that on one hand, I don't want to be insensitive to the connections between mental illness and mass shootings because I do think that just on a deep psychological level in all of us, when we hear a story like the one that happened at Sandy Hook in which somebody went and shot a bunch of kids, what else can we think of but mental illness? I mean, in a way, it's very understandable that the lingua franca at those times becomes the rhetoric of insanity because who but a crazy person would go and, and do and act like that? And I, I want to say again, I, I think that that's very, very understandable human emotion. And I also think it's very clear that people who commit these mass shootings are, in many cases, meet different criteria for mental illness. There was a great article by Mother Jones Magazine where they looked at the psychiatric histories of people who had committed mass shootings. I guess there have been um, 62 mass shootings since 1970, 
And what they found that at least in 38 uh, of the mass shootings since 1970, there was some kind of psychiatric symptomatology according to their kind of armchair diagnosis. And so people had been diagnosed with paranoia, delusions, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And so in a way, I'm not trying to argue that there is no mental health history here because I think you know, that would be a, a, an untenable argument. At the same time, uh, again, I, as I mentioned before, I'm somebody who studies psychiatric stigma, and so I think that there are three what I call central myths of this association between uh, schizophrenia and, and mental illness and gun violence that I think we need to be particularly sensitive to, particularly aware of as we move forward because, again, from the perspective of somebody who studies stigma and mental illness, I think there are three vital points that we need to, need to keep in mind that I argue are myths of our current, uh, our current debate about, uh, about guns and mass shooting that, to my mind, are incredibly problematic and are things that we really need to, 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 take, to take aware of. So let me just tell you over the next you know, 10 minutes or so what, what I think these three central myths are. Uh, and the first is the myth that's perpetuated a lot in the aftermath of these shootings. And this is the myth that the mentally ill, quote unquote, and I, we heard from the introduction before that really the problem is who do we define as the mentally ill? But there is this central myth that this group of people called the mentally ill are disproportionately violent towards others. Now certainly we see this myth not just in the aftermath of gun shootings, we see it in American popular culture. If anybody here has watched Law and Order, you know that there's a formula to those shows, and pretty much every time somebody with schizophrenia shows up on that show, they're gonna invariably be the killer. It doesn't really take much guesswork uh, 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 in that regard. And this is a stigmatization that plays out not just in popular media, but also in popular attitudes. There have been great studies, for example, of the police. This is a study by Watson, Corrigan, and Adati from Psychiatric Services where they basically queried the police, and the police were overwhelmingly more likely to attribute violent attentions to people with schizophrenia, even if, uh, even if the, the, the act itself wasn't violent. So in other words, they felt like if there was a perpetrator of a, uh, something that was schizophrenic, that that person was far and away more likely to be violent. So this is something that exists in American popular opinion, American popular attitude, American popular culture. Now, why am I calling this a myth? Uh, and one reason is that if you look at the actual data of violent acts and shootings that are caused by people who are diagnosed with what's called Axis I mental illness, major mental illness, the numbers are really quite shocking. And I'll just summarize the, 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 um, the literature by telling you that um, across the board, studies that look at gun crimes, first of all, find that people diagnosed with mental illness are far less likely than the national average to commit gun crimes. The average number uh, percentages of crimes committed by persons, again, diagnosed with this vague category of mental illness is somewhere in the three to four percent. And these numbers are borne out by studies at Columbia University and also by the National Center for Health Statistics. And these numbers are actually lower than people not diagnosed with mental illness. And so in a way, the numbers of gun crimes just on an aggregate level are far lower in, in, the, in, the, in the mentally ill. And people say, you know, when I give this talk a lot of times, they'll say, well, what about paranoia? What about command hallucinations? What about other kinds of symptoms that people readily associate with violence? And again and again, people find that the risk conferred about violence to others for people who s suffer from these symptoms is far lower than another category of people, and that category we might call the same. So in a way, if you're just going by the aggregate numbers, sanity is far, a far greater risk factor than insanity uh, for, committing, for committing a gun crime, if you're going to look at the aggregate level. Now, um, there's also a, a very important body of literature that suggests not only do these people not commit gun crimes, but actually having a mental illness reduces your risk of committing a, a violent crime over time. And so people who study schizophrenia argue that because schizophrenia is an illness that causes social isolation and social withdrawal, these people actually are far more likely to keep to themselves or live you know, homeless or under a bridge. They, they reject social isolation. And so they argue that actually mental illness is, is, is a protective factor against violence, that in a way, if you have mental illness, you're less at risk. Now, the other point of this is that on the other hand, 
there are clear associations between schizophrenia and violence, but this, the risk of schizophrenia and violence is actually that people with schizophrenia are far, far, far more likely to be the victims of violence than people who are not diagnosed with mental illness. This is a study by John Brecky and Kathy Prindle at the USC School of Social Work. They tracked actual police contacts in the Los Angeles area over a five-year period. And what they found is that if you were diagnosed with serious mental illness and you lived in Los Angeles, your chance was 65 to 130 percent more likely than the general population that you were going to have the crap beaten out of you by someone else rather than that you were going to be the perpetrator of a crime. So in a way here what we see is that mental illness on the, on the grand reality is actually an inversion of what's actually happening in that people, because maybe they're odd or they're talking to themselves uh, or they're withdrawn, they're far more likely to be targets rather than to be, uh, rather than to be perpetrators of violence. And this is also borne out in shooting research. So there was just a study last month um, in, uh, in uh, the East Coast that found that people with mental illness were also far more likely to be shot by the police, again, at numbers that are far in excess of, of everybody else. So what I'm saying here is that this stereotype that we have um, is at odds. So why is it the case, then, that we invert on-the-ground reality in the aftermath of these shootings? And there's a great researcher, Jeff Swanson, at Duke, who basically studies these mass shootings. And what he argues, you might, you might remember a, a few minutes ago, I showed you a slide that said that there have been 62 mass shootings in the United States since 1970. And if you think about it, there are 31,000 gun deaths in the United States every single year. Uh, and so in a way, what we're doing, at, at least uh, what Swanson argues, is that these mass shootings are incredibly rare. He calls them rare acts of violence but they're tremendously influential in terms of catalyzing our national debate, right? So in the aftermath of Arizona or Colorado or Newtown, that, those are the debates that we use to set our, our national conversation. And what he argues is that this is a huge mistake because what we're doing is we're not, a, uh, sorry, we're not addressing everyday violence. In a way, we're using these rare acts of violence, again, 62 over 35 years, is, or 40 years, is, is statistically entirely insignificant. It's a huge event, it's a huge trauma. But to set our policy to prevent these things that happen you know, uh, very rarely doesn't address the bigger aggregate level question. And so what he argues is that, in a way, what we're doing is we're, ba we're basically um, trying to treat the, um, the black swan, in a way. Now, I think about this when I go through airport security, you know, one in a billion people are the shoe bomber, but we set up this whole system to prevent against another shoe bombing, but we don't, you know, in a, and in a way, that's like a one in a million event, and what he argues is we're doing the same thing with, with, gun, with gun violence. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't things that are predictive of violence, and particularly of gun violence. We have pretty much unquestionable data that looks at, um, at, at, at risk factors for violence. And so I can tell you with tremendous specificity that if substances are involved in a confrontation, if somebody had been drinking or smoking pot or doing something else, not that that person met criteria for being an alcoholic or, or something, but if substances are involved in a shooting or in a confrontation, there's about a six or seven time more likely uh, incidence of a, of a gun incident uh, from that. And that's, of course, important for me because I live in Printer's Alley and people know that you can have a loaded gun in a bar, I guess, in, in Tennessee. So I think about that when I walk down the street sometimes. But we know that having substance use around increases the likelihood of violence. Again, not mental illness, but substance use. Another predictive factor is a, a past history of violence. So we know that if somebody has been violent in the past, we know that they're far more likely to be violent in the future. So again, people who have shot somebody or attacked somebody before, those people statistically are at greater risk for, for shooting somebody again in the future. Um, I actually love this slide because I, I say that another risk factor for gun violence is knowing someone. And I say that because often when we think about uh, gun violence, the, the stereotype we have is there's going to be some crazy stranger who's going to come out of the blue and they're going to shoot us. But if you look at actual data about shootings, this is a study from a, a group of Harvard sociologists. And they did a, they did a project in high, high violence areas outside of Boston. 
And you can see in this bottom thing here, uh, what they found was that 85% of all the shootings in this high shooting area were done between people within social networks. So people were 85%, if you were shot, you had an 85% chance of being shot by your relative, by your neighbor, by your boyfriend, by your ex-boyfriend, by somebody in your gang, somebody in another gang. 85% of the shootings were within a social network. And so only 15% of the shootings were some stranger coming up out of the blue and shooting you. So in a way, social networks are incredibly predictive at an ag on an aggregate level for shooting. And the last risk factor that we know about from guns is actually access <laughs> to firearms. That shouldn't be very surprising. But we know, for example, that the United States, if we're just looking at gun death, we're far and away number one in the world uh, in completed suicide, 19,000 completed suicides a year. And part of why that is is because of access to firearms. This is an image of uh, Mindy McCready, people might know in her, uh, you know, when in her glory days, and people know that she had commit, uh, attempted suicide numerous times and, and, and lived because she was using pills, and all of a sudden when firearms were brought into the mix, she became another one of these statistics. And so the take-home point of this section is just that um, I feel that population-based literature on guns and mental illness suggests that we are drawing the wrong conclusions from mass shootings if we're asking psychiatrists to predict future events because what we see are two important things. One is that psychiatric diagnosis is in no way predictive of who's gonna shoot somebody. And in part that is because the category of mental illness itself is not predictive of who's gonna cause a gun crime. Um, and so in a way we put psychiatrists in a false position. Now I'm just gonna go on for about another five minutes. I'm gonna make sure we have time. So let me just breeze through what I think the other two myths are. I won't spend uh, too much time on them, I apologize. This is part of a longer project, except to say that, the other, that one of the other myths is that there's this question of mental illness as always having been a violent category dating back to burr holes and ships of fools and all this kind of stereotypes we hear about mental illness. And what I show in my research is actually that if you take schizophrenia, for example, the illness that's very often associated with gun crimes, that we see that actually through the 1950s, we thought about schizophrenia as an illness of shyness or docility. And so if you look back at representations through the 1950s, you'll see that basically we assumed in psychiatry that people with schizophrenia were very often calm, shy. A lot of times we thought, here are articles from the 1920s and 30s from the New York Times, that schizophrenia was a condition that afflicted the, uh, the brilliant poets or novelists of our time. Um, we also thought about schizophrenia as an illness that afflicted middle-class white women who were being driven crazy, kind of like Betty Draper in, in Mad Men for kind of sitting home too long and, and uh, just kind of going, going nuts. And certainly this was a representation. Anybody here seen The Snake Pit, the 19... 48, Olivia de Havilland, fantastic movie. So people know that at that time we thought about schizophrenia as an illness that afflicted, afflicted middle-class white women. Um, that was also an image that showed up in early pharmaceutical advertisements. Here's an ad from 1952 for the, from the American Journal of Psychiatry. All of a sudden in 1968, we changed our definition of what schizophrenia was. This is the DSM-2, came out in 1968. And we added that language in bold. We said, the patient's attitude is frequently hostile and aggressive, and his behavior tends to be consistent with his delusions. This was entirely new, uh, and I, I, in my book I talk about why I think this came about, but the argument is basically there was a lot of political unrest in the 1960s, and lo and behold, what I found was that when we added this language to the criteria for schizophrenia, all of a sudden we started to see new characters be defined as schizophrenia as schizophrenic, and in the 1960s, these characters were invariably angry black men who were on the loose, shooting up the world. This hadn't been part of the schizophrenia debate before. Here's an ad for the antipsychotic medication Haldol, showed up in the American Journal of Psychiatry three months after the DSM-2 came out, and you can see that basically they're constructing schizophrenia as an illness of a guy who I think not ironically looks like James Brown, the godfather of soul, kind of shaking his fist at the physician viewer. And again, part of why I'm arguing that this happened was because we changed our definition of schizophrenia. And what I show in my research is that that, that, that had tremendous implications. 
And so the take home point of this part is just to say that there hasn't just been an increase in violent behavior by the mentally ill, that in part what we've done is we've changed the frame that surrounds mental illness in a way that encourages us to associate schizophrenia particularly with violence. And in two minutes or less, I'll just say the last point that I make in the longer project is that very often we talk about mental illness a, as a, the act of a loner. So you hear this a lot in the aftermath of Sandy Hook that Adam Lanza was a loner. And in fact, what we're doing now is we're studying his brain, we're studying his DNA to find out how this very one particular demented individual could have committed this act. And the reason I call this a myth is to say that, again, we haven't always thought about this and that there's been a transformation, particularly about race uh, and the race of the shooter that's played out. And I say this because if you look at American popular culture in the 1960s, the people who were diagnosed as kind of schizophrenic, gun-toting, crazy people were invariably African-American leaders of black power and the Black Panthers. And so I do a lot of work with this book, Rob, uh, Robert Williams' Negroes with Guns, that came out in the 1960s. And you can see that basically he was advocating, he was saying black people need to arm themselves to protect themselves against white violence. And what happened in the aftermath of that was that the FBI hung uh, most wanted posters over the entire South that basically said, this guy has schizophrenia because he wants guns and you better get, get out of the way. And, and, and they were kind of blaming black culture. People also probably know that Malcolm X at certain points was argu arguing for armed, it wasn't armed aggression, it was armed self-defense. And again, I've got evidence from my book that shows how Malcolm X was diagnosed with schizophrenia by FBI profilers. Here's, a, here's an excerpt from his chart that I was very delighted to uh, uncover from the uh, records. Uh, uh, um, and you can see that, again, because he wanted guns, he was being diagnosed as mentally ill. And this is also something that played out in, in relation to the, Bl the Black Panthers, who were arguing for, for armed self-defense. And basically, uh, the American society said, this, this is a mental illness. And it's not just a mental illness of w individual brain, it's a mental illness of black politics more broadly. Now, I think it's kind of interesting to think about the irony here because basically what they were arguing in the 60s was that we need self-defense to protect ourselves against government oppression. That was kind of the central argument in the 1960s, and that led to a tremendous cultural response that led ultimately to the Gun Control Act of 1968. So all of a sudden people started saying, well, if all these guys want to arm themselves, we better do something to protect ourselves, and that's where our major gun control legislation came from. And it's just interesting because, in a way, the Tea Party now is making exactly the same argument. I mean, it's almost line for line. People are making the same argument. We need to protect ourselves against government aggression. But I think we can say that the irony now is that we're not saying we need to control guns to all white people. We need to keep the Tea Party. They're the people who shouldn't be buying guns. Instead, the people in the Tea Party now are in Congress and in the Senate. So in a way, for the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a real tension between blaming the individual and blaming the culture. And when we blame culture, it leads to this larger cultural response, whereas when we blame the individual, it lets us locate the illness just on this one demented individual, and there's a particular politics to that. And so let me say in conclusion that I'm in no way saying that people who have serious mental illness histories should have guns. And so I, in a way I agree with the first comment here that this should be a pretty short talk and the answer should be no. Uh, I agree with that very much. But I also think that there's a politics to the ways we associate guns with mental illness that really should give us pause. And part of it is that uh, what it does is it stigmatizes people with mental illness. So if we convey the message that the people who are shooting people are these demented others who are kind of come and attack us. In a way, it's a form of othering. That's how stigma works, to say it's not about me, it's about you, and we should just be f afraid of that other guy. And again, I'm not trying to subvert progress. I think that we're making some important steps forward here. But I would also say that if we look at gun violence at the aggregate level again in the United States, we have 31,000 gun deaths a year, and overwhelmingly, it's not the scary other person coming to shoot us. We shoot each other. <laughs> I mean, that's what the data overwhelmingly shows, that we shoot our relatives, we shoot ourselves when we're accidentally cleaning our gun, 
other kinds of things. And so in a way, to say that this is a scary other does a lot of political work that I think we need to be uh, aware of. Now, I think it's risky also because it does reinforce the stigmatization that the people with mental illness are ticking time bombs and that we need to be aware of them. And I also think that this thing about mental illness uh, as being caused by mental ill others also effaces another kind of form of mental illness that plays out, which is a, a form of anxiety about living around guns all the time. There was a great piece I was on television with Ira Glass a couple of weeks ago from uh, NPR, and he was showing how people who live in low-income areas in Chicago, African-American teenagers, are at tremendously high risk of post-traumatic stress disorder because there are so many guns in their high schools. In a way, their risk of mental illness is going up not because they're gonna go shoot somebody, but because they're living around the threat of death all the time. And so in a way, what we forget in this conversation is the mental illness that we're producing by secondary relationships in which guns are present, whether, whether or not they're, they're shooting. Um, and so I guess the take home point for me is that in a way, what we do when we focus on mental illness, the way we do, again, not to say we shouldn't have it be part of our reasoning, but the way we do focus on mental illness, we're building evidence from uncommon things, and it makes us harder to intervene on all sides of the debate if we don't start trying to build evidence from common things. So again, I mentioned before, I think there are other risk factors for gun violence that we should probably be talking a bit more about when we're, when we're talking about mental illness. And the take home pro point is that no matter what side of the gun debate you're on or how you feel about the Second Amendment or other issues that I think are really valid points of debate, that in a way, it's a much more productive conversation if we see that this is a problem that affects all of us rather than a problem that's imposed on us by them, which I think is how stigma works. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, that, that makes me proud to be a Vanderbilt academic um, because I think what Jonathan's done is sort of really reshaped and, uh, and refocused our attention on a bunch of questions that are being in a sense, pushed to the side by this focus on uh, mental illness. But I, uh, before I open this discussion to, to all of you, I'd just like to ask you that, in a sense, the, the big question that, that I began with, um, mental illness is, is, you know, is there around the world, however you define it. But in other countries, the levels of gun violence are far, far lower, and there's a reason for that, which is that people can't get guns. <laughs> and I mean, if I, being perfectly candid, I mean, I would say in an unprofessional way that uh, many of my British friends would say that uh, America's suffering from a national psychosis. I mean, I don't know if that is the right word to use, and it has to do with the belief that you that we should and have guns uh, on a you know misreading of the Second Amendment uh, which I, I I'm, I'm pretty sure is, is is true that that's not what the Second Amendment says it's, it's the right to form militias not the right to bear I mean I'm leaving that aside okay I don't want to get that but but the, the the whole idea that we all that we all kind of need uh, lethal weapons to protect ourselves looks like a a sort of national psychotic condition. Now, on the if once you have that, then you've got all these problems that are generated, and then you try and figure out who are the really mentally ill. But how would you address, Jonathan, this this sort of alien view that <laughs> you guys, or we guys in this country, are already suffering from a sort of low-grade psychotic condition built into the, our understanding of our Second Amendment rights? Well, you know. So it's an unfriendly question, really. No, no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. I mean, <coughs> on one hand, I, I agree with that completely in that, I mean, w first let's just take the broadest possible frame, which is when, when, when is, when, how is psychiatry useful here? And what I've been trying to argue here is that we're trying to make psychiatry do something that it can't do, which is psychiatry, there's no psychiatric diagnosis that says I can examine you 
and I can predict if you're going to shoot right. somebody. Right. It, shooting is not part of any psychiatric diagnosis, not part of any diagnostic category. And in fact, there have been great studies that have shown that basically people who meet the stereotype criteria for mass shooter, actually, psychiatrists even there can't predict who's going to shoot somebody. So they do, they, you know, psychiatrists a thousand times a week in certain areas are seeing, you know, angry, white, gun owning, paranoid, like all the criteria that we say are the, you know, young man kind of thing. Even then, psychiatrists can't predict it. So psychiatric science is not predictive in a way. And I think that what we're doing is we're enacting legislation that asks psychiatry to do something it can't do. And so I think that's a little crazy. Um, and, um, but we do know, uh, in line with the first part of your question, that, that a systems issue that limits access. So it's not a predictive issue, it's an access issue. And so we know this, for example, in studies of suicide. People are gonna have suicidal thoughts in their moments of worst despair. And at that moment, whether they live or die depends on if there's a gun around. I mean, that's, you cannot, there, you, it's almost an irrefutable fact. Um, we are not just the high, the, you know, I mean, we, again, as I said, we have 19,000 gun suicides a year. It's overwhelmingly first place in the um, first world nations. And so the access to the gun is the issue. Now, whether or not we want to address that, access is the point where psychiatry can be helpful. But again, there's legislation that tries, tries to block that. So people might remember in Texas, for example, it was illegal for a doctor to ask if you, do you have guns in your home. It was uh, illegal for a while. Um, and so in a way, we're, we're intervening at the level of access, which is the level at which this, this can be helpful. Now, I will admit, if you pressure me, d did anybody else, know, anybody else here saw the, the NRA press conference? But there was a lot of language that was being used about it, it was, it, um, so the classic definition of paranoia is you overgeneralize a threat. There's some small threat, but you overgeneralize it and say the entire world's against me or the government's against me. And I kept wanting to ask during that press conference, who is the threat from? Exactly who is the, is the threat from? And I do think that there's this sense that plays to people's worst fears that says, the threat is the other. The threat is the racial other, or the stigmatized mentally ill other. And so I don't. I don't think it's. It's in part maybe a mass psychosis, as you suggest, but it's also a marketing strategy that people make a lot of money on uh, by selling guns. If you, if there's this sense of the other person's going to come get me, we know that that dries up guns. If we think Obama's going to come take my guns. Gun sales go out uh, of the roof and we can't make enough bullets. And so in a way, it's also, it's not just a mental illness, it's also, I would say, a, a, a marketing strategy that at least has been pretty successful uh, from their perspective at this point, to this point. Okay, I think it's time we um, invited questions of the lady. Oh, uh, too far away for me to tell up there. When Eisenhower got ready to leave office, he warned against the military industrial complex becoming too close. When we had the response to 9-11, we saw a war culture tendency begin to really be bad in our society. You didn't mention war or a war culture factor in what you were saying a while ago. I'm wondering if much can be done until we recognize that as a very important factor and the money that's involved there, as we've seen since the shooting in the Newton place, the tendency for NRA and others to pour money into defending the having of guns and the use of guns and so forth and the need for guns. And I think that's the thing that has been underlying a lot of this too is that we saw this in the Iraq situation, a constant tendency on the part of certain people in government to portray this is a scary world, this is a dangerous world. Prior to World War II, we didn't go around saying things like that. 
but since then, this is what's grown up and gotten hold of us. No, I think that's a really brilliant question. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I, I agree with you completely in that, you know, there are societies that are in a way more militarized than our own, where there are even more military guns. So I gave some talks in Israel last year, for example. People have guns, but they don't have the level of, the, they don't have the kind of shooting problem that we have. And in a way, it's a, it's a different kind of attitude. And so there's certainly aspects of the message that gets out. I have a colleague at, at Vanderbilt who works on masculinity. Uh, and basically, he says that this kind of attitude that you're talking about is also embedded in the idea of kind of what it means to be a man. Um, we, uh, the other part that was kind of, I thought, pretty uh, nefarious was, th of course, there's a video game culture. That's an another part of this. And uh, the NRA w initially was attacking all the video games as saying this is another I thing that's telling us this. But of course, the NRA and the gun industry are investing a lot of times in, in the video games. So it's a pretty complicated uh, connection. So I think all these things are, are, are part. I completely agree. Thank you for your well-reasoned and well-thought, complex and also convoluted <laughs> narrative there. Um, convoluted is high praise, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it, the social policy side of it is extraordinarily complex uh, on a number of issues. I come to this as having been a chaplain in a state prison, Tennessee State Penitentiary from 73 to 83, and then from there to Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute. Um, the, the question that you raised is how do we intervene at the line level before something happens? And that's not going to be at the psychiatrist's couch. I it's agree going to be at line providers at the very lowest level, including in prisons, guards, or other people. Uh, there, there were two cases in point. Um, when I was at the prison, I had an individual who said, I'm going to take some hostages. Now, he had some very serious mental problems. I reported this to the psychological examiner, and he said, we can't admit him to the psychiatric West 100 unit because he hasn't done anything yet. Uh -huh. Now, had I said, he's threatening to harm himself or kill himself, I suspect that probably there would have been a bed. That's just my guess. I don't know that for sure. Well, guess what? He was not admitted, and he did take hostages of counselors. But that's a, a line intervention response, and that's the uncommon response. The other one was at Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute. An individual comes to us. Uh, and had difficulty being admitted, but he was hallucinating Jim Jones's voice. He had been a member of that community and felt guilty that he had not died with all of them, and he's got command hallucinations to go and waste a schoolyard. And the uh, admitting officer almost did not admit him, and he talked himself into being admitted. Now, he also had substance abuse issues. He had blown off his hand while intoxicated. This person was extraordinarily at high risk. Fortunately, that was a positive scenario in that he was treated, was received. Um, so my perspective is different in that sense of history, but I understand the extraordinarily complex, how do we do this? But I do believe that we've got to identify at line levels and begin to intervene before stuff happens. And these people that are at high risk are identifiable, particularly when they say, I'm going to, For sure. that's a high risk situation. Well, okay. let me just, I'll answer really quickly because I want to make sure we don't, I know there's another question, I want to make sure we don't run out of time. A lot to say about that, except that, of course, I completely agree with you. And part of what, one of the risk factors, as I mentioned, was past history of, of violence. But I think that, you know, again, I, I, the very first thing you said is something I agree with completely. I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm not trying to slam my own profession. But I will say that psychiatry a lot of times gets itself into trouble if it tries to exceed the, the value of its, of its diagnoses and in a way, so for example, command hallucinations that you mentioned, overwhelmingly, the, most people with command hallucinations don't, don't go shoot, shoot people in a way. So how do you know 
who's going to and who's not going to. And in a way, I agree with you that it's a it's a system problem as much as it is an individual problem. An individual problem. Just one one more question. I don't know if everybody's aware, but there's a bill being considered right now yep. by the Tennessee legislature that would greatly expand the number of people that mental health professionals are supposed to report as potentially dangerous. It would expand, as far as I can tell, to hundreds or thousands of, of, t of patients that get reported to the local police and the local police then report it to the FBI. And this is similar to the law you mentioned in New York. Uh, so I, I was just curious, Dr. Metzl, if, if anybody's consulted you about that, or, ha has, or have you had a chance to give any input? The, the, the Tennessee Senate voted unanimously two weeks ago to, to vote to pass this as a law, and it's now being considered by the House of Representatives. I, if anybody out there knows anybody, uh, please contact me. <laughs> I would love to. I, so it's funny, I was involved in the New York case, uh, and I was, uh, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, some of the state senators uh, in New York and also working with the mayor of Bridgeport, but I haven't been involved in Tennessee in kind of to my uh, frustration a little bit. So I, I welcome any, any advice any, anybody might have because again, I think we're, we, we have a lot of historical evidence that we don't want mental health <laughs> professionals, it's, again, in relation to everything, everything said. So I would love any advice about that. Do we have time just for one more question? The one yeah. yeah. Sure. View. Please. My name is Lori Leon Mendelson, and I identify as a person who has psychiatric diagnoses. And I'm very offended by the title of this to even associate people with mental illness as bearing arms is completely contradictory, contradictory to me. Why doesn't it say white men should not bear arms or teenagers should not bear arms? This was a design by the NRA to offshoot, and I remember hearing that speech, it was to offshoot any attention to the NRA and um, guns and to put it on the mentally ill, if you want to call us the mentally ill rather than people with mental illnesses. I think it's obscene to have this title because I think it encourages and extend, extends the ideology that people with mental illness are violent. And yes, you're right. People with uh, mental illnesses are less likely to commit violent acts. And yet, thanks to E. Fully Tory, Fuller Tory, we have some skewed statistics from the FBI saying that people with mental illness are violent. Well, let me I'm just also, say, I, I'm not, let me just finish sure. saying this, please. I'm offended that you would say at the end of this talk, as somebody who's working to end stigma, that you would still back people with mental illnesses not receiving, um, not getting guns. So I have a question for you. And I spent some time working on it this morning. Sure. This would include Charlton Heston, of course, <laughs> from my cold dead hands, Ronald Reagan, Tipper Gore, Justin Timberlake, Abraham Lincoln, Jane Pauley, Carrie Fisher, Teddy Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Thelonious Monk, Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, Ernest Hemingway, Edgar Allan Poe, Elton John, Harrison Ford, John Nash, Mark Twain, Vincent Van Gogh, Marlon Brando, Janet Jackson, Marie Osmond, Courtney Love, Mike Wallace, Cheryl Crow, Ray Charles, Paula Abdul, Drew Carey, Patty Duke Aston, Eric Clapton, Billy Joel, Charles Dickens, I said, Terry Bradshaw, Ludwig von Beethoven, Princess Diana, and Brooke Shields, all of whom have diagnosed mental illnesses. So are we saying that those people and one, one out of every five Americans alone having a mental illness should not be, should be considered in this kind of a statistic, in this kind of a talk, I really encourage you to include the mental health consumer movement, and I'm not talking about NAMI. I'm talking about the mental health consumer movement, Mad Nation, Support Coalition International, people who are combined of um, survivors and ex-patients who know what it's been like to be misdiagnosed and mistreated, who stand up for our rights, and who really do work to end stigma. You know, um I apologize if I wasn't more clear about this, but pretty much every point you've made was one that I tried to, uh, that I agree with. Uh, and, and, I, and in this talk, I, I, w I tried to be very clear in the beginning that the title was a direct quote from the NRA. It was not my quote. Uh, and so I actually, we can talk later. Uh, we're out of time and I need to get back to school, but I actually don't think we have the point of agreement, disagreement that it sounds like you 
Thank you for all your questions.